It actually begins to really affect our thinking. I uh, saw where uh, a youth leader posted and asked for some lessons on how to help young people develop healthy mental habits to help them, you know, mentally. And I have posted Philippians chapter 4. And I believe if there was ever a day we need to practice Philippians chapter 4, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I don't think we need to stick our head in the sand like an ostrich, but I also don't think we should stick our faces in the uh, fire hydrant of trouble news, because that's kind of what we do, right? People have got their face just fully in the fire hydrant, and they're wondering why their minds are blown away. We have to try to understand that we have access to a greater experience, a greater dimension of peace, and it is through the Spirit of God. So, uh, somebody say Holy Ghost. Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. John had $500. Anna has $400. Peter had $700. Who has the most money? Anna. Of course. Anna. Anna, why does Anna have more money? Because she has it. You know, I, 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 I think it's important for us to recognize this principle. It's not based on what you had. It's based on what you have. And people can say, well, I used to have a lot of faith. I did this for the Lord. But, but really what matters today is what do you have today? Do you believe today? Uh, and uh, I think that that is applicable to our current situation. Have you all ever heard this possession is nine-tenths of the law? And uh, that it, it, it is, a, it is a, an expression meaning that ownership is easier to maintain if one has possession of something and difficult to enforce if one does not. And so if you want to possess it, if you want to own it, you got to possess it. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of promises of God that are available to us, but we don't possess it. And so uh, I, I want to, I believe that what we're going to talk about today kind of fits into that. Last Sunday, I taught on the fact that the Lord says He's a jealous God and how that is very offensive to the postmodern world view. But the God of the Bible, He loves us and many of the things that He tells us in His Word is not because He has a personal preference as much as He knows things that are good for us and things that are bad for us. Can anybody give me an example of something that your kids have done that you that they might have thought it was all fun and games, but you realize this is a bad thing? We have gotta help them. Anybody? Fighting? Your kids like to fight, but you probably shouldn't. Yeah, I, I think of uh, seeing Olivia uh, crawling up the stairs. That's the coolest thing ever until she falls, right? So a parent would say. Uh, no, don't do that, right? Yeah. <coughs> what now? Playing with daddy's tools. Playing with daddy's tools. Yeah, that's right. Extension yeah. Extension poles. Hey, extension poles make great pole vault poles. <laughs> yeah, and they're also a good reason to get a whooping. I, ha I got one over that, I believe. Romans chapter 7, that was where we're going to start. Uh, Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 10. And the commandment, Romans 7 and 10. And the commandment which was ordained to lie, I have found to be unto death. For sin, <coughs> taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. 
was then that which is good made unto me death? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by the which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, you have to kind of think about that for a minute. I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more that I, that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, say this with me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For I know that in verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in verse 21. I find that a law that when I would do good, what's it say? Evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I might myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. I got a question a few days ago and it really kind of prompted me. And, and the thing that came to me is there's a lot of laws in the Bible. That's right. There's a lot of laws in the Bible. Let, let's just kind of do a thought experiment of what you can remember. I think I have most of them written down. What are some laws that you can think of that are in the Bible? Yeah, but I'm talking about just an overarching big big title law. Don't like, what now? Don't kill somebody. No, no. Again, that, I'm talking about the law of the Old Testament. Big, big, big titles. The law of the Old Testament. There is the law of the mind. There is the law of sin and death. Uh, there is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There, the law of liberty. Yeah, you, that was my next one. You got my notes over there? The perfect law of liberty. Very good. There's a joke going to come from somewhere over here. Wow. This kid is one sharp kid. The perfect law of liberty. And I liken this to the fact in our natural world there are many laws that have been observed that uh, Sir Isaac Newton, they say, was sitting under an apple tree and he observed the, the apple, when it detached from the tree, didn't just float around. It didn't go up, <coughs> but it, what did it do? It failed. And he, from that, made a hypothesis that we know as the law of gravity. And obviously, everybody already knew what he observed. They just didn't have, they didn't put the word of law to it. And so, there are a lot of people that are unfamiliar with the uh, mathematical equation that Sir Isaac Newton gave to the law of gravity. And so, a child, though they may be totally ignorant of the law of gravity, gravity is no less a draw, a reality in that child's life, they will fall if they climb up on the roof. If you climb up on the roof, you can be as dumb as a rock, can't even spell gravity, can't pronounce gravity. If you take a step off the edge of that roof, gravity's reality is not based upon your knowledge of it. 
In the same way, there are moral laws. There is a there are moral laws, and there are many people in our culture today. They are ignorant. They are unaware. They have not been educated that uh, if you participate in uh, premarital sex, that that produces a child. And what they are unaware of is that process, that whole relationship that's involved, that is driven through the sensual nature that we all have in us, that, that it, it creates all kinds of chaos. All kinds of chaos comes from that, and because they don't understand the Scripture teaches that, that, that sexual relationships should happen within the bonds of a committed relationship, specifically marriage, uh, because the natural progression, sex isn't for, for pleasure. That's what the, the world is trying to say. Well, sex is you just, it's just something you do. It's something you enjoy. Uh, no consequences. When in reality, it is very consequential. And, and the ultimate purpose of that, God gave that to us, is the miracle of life. And inside of a covenant relationship, it is a beautiful thing. How beautiful is it? Look at all the little babies. That's the most beautiful thing in the world. And that is the outflow of a God-ordained relationship that is wrapped up in a, in a where there, there is that uh, element of a sexual relationship. It was intended to be a place of intimacy. But many people today, they ignore it. And the purpose of abortion and why it's such a huge thing is because they are trying to erase the moral consequences of a promiscuous life. I would say I am pro-choice. And the choice isn't whether you get to kill or let the baby live. The choice is are you going to live a virtuous life? A virtuous life is the best choice. Right? And if you're married, whatever happens within the bonds of marriage, it's a holy thing. But outside of the bonds of marriage, it creates so much havoc. Right? And so I'm talking, that's the moral law. A lot of people don't know the moral law, but their lives are being destroyed because of the reality. Just like the guy stepping off the roof and they breaks his leg, a lot of people operate in the realm of morality or immorality and don't understand. The, Bible, the reason why God doesn't want any of that to happen is because He understands the outflow of those illicit activities produces terrible consequences. Do you know one of the, 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 the underlying causes of most of our cultural challenges, prison, uh, 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 incarceration, poverty, uh, it, 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 it goes all the way down to, to single parent homes. Now God can make up the difference. A lot of times He makes up the difference through grandparents. But at the end of the day, there are children that are raised in a single parent home are more li likely to live in poverty or more likely to die of, of violence or more likely to be incarcerated. Or that it's, it's a, the Bible tells us it's a curse. But people are unaware of what's amazing to me in this culture is people talk about, you know, how do we, how do we, what's prison reform? What's uh, educational reform? You know, most of the educational challenges we have today is poverty. Poverty that is a product of, of there being one person trying to provide for the children. And government, to some degree, created this by, by trying to erase the, the difficulty involved if there's not a father in the home. So they have, they, they may be uh, unintended consequences of, of misplaced compassion as they try to help people not need a husband, a man. And, uh, and that, that's a moral law. But Romans 7 is, if anybody ever reads Romans 7, we all can identify with the realities of, of the absolute depravity of the flesh. That is in, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's a reality. And some people stay in Romans 7 and say, well, that's just the way I am. You know, I want to do better, but I just can't do better. When I, you know, read the Bible. When I would do good, evil is present with me. And they never really understand 
that Romans 7 describes the problem of the flesh. <coughs> Romans 8 is the answer. Romans 7 is the bankruptcy of flesh. Chapter 7, bankruptcy. Anybody ever heard of that? That's what chapter 7, it is the bankruptcy of the flesh. Chapter 8 is how we get out of bankruptcy. Romans chapter 8 answers all of the problems in Romans chapter 7. Let's read it together. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Let's read it together. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see that? It's... There's no, it does not say there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, period. It's a comma. There is a, uh, a clause. There is a qualifier. If, if you will walk not after the flesh and walk after the Spirit, you will not have condemnation. You have condemnation, you're walking after the flesh. You're thinking after the flesh. You're talking after the flesh. You're acting after the flesh. But if you will walk after the Spirit, all the things the flesh creates, they bring condemnation. If you walk <coughs> after the Spirit, you won't have condemnation. Chapter 2. For the law... Everybody say the law. The law. Of the Spirit. Of, the spirit. of, life, of life. In Christ Jesus... The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It, it's a, that's a long law. The, life, the law of the life of the Spirit in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So there is a law of gravity, but there is a, a law that, that to a great degree frees us from the law of gravity. Can anybody tell me or guess or give me a suggestion? What is the law that frees us from the law of gravity? Aerodynamics. The law of aerodynamics is what they use to build airplanes. And there are there are things they really have a hard time describing. They don't know why some things in aerodynamics work. Uh, even though they, they understand this is what you do to make something fly, there's some things within the law of thermodynamics. It doesn't really make sense. It, it doesn't fully compute. They have to build in some known facts to create their formulas because some formulas don't work just based upon the, the math. I read this about two or three months ago. I thought, hmm, that'll preach. And that, that's, that's the fact that I, 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 had, I, I wrote on the airplane. I wrote on a couple of different airplanes over the past few days. I wrote on a new one. It was so nice. The leather was just so pliable. I had... Just I had just enough room before my knees and armrests were nice. I had this nice little head pillow back here and I was like, oh, this is so nice. I rode another plane. I, it, must, it must be 50 years old. Those were airplanes, they engineered them to last forever. I don't know how old, but it was old. I mean, it's creaking. As long as it was up, as on the ground, I mean, it was right like a rattle. I looked at the guy and said, this is a rattle trap. But as soon as it left the ground, all the rattles stopped. Once it hit the ground, but once, but once that old airplane was able to, to, to loose the bonds of gravity, a lot of stuff that was clunking stopped clunking. And, and it just... And it went all the way up. And you look out around the window... And all that stuff that was so big when I was down on the ground disappeared. And is that not a perfect picture of the law of the Spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death? And so our challenge is, is we've got to keep the law of the Spirit at work. In the same way that airplane can't stay in the air forever, just basically because it filled up once, that airplane's got to come down and roll into the hangar and they got to tighten some screws and grease the, the, the wheels and change the tires. There's maintenance they have to do so they roll it back out there. That, that they can, I, I wonder how many miles, Brother Bobby, and, 
a, a, a commercial airplane has on it before they retire. It flies for years. They make a lot of money off those airplanes. Up and down, up and down. And, and that's, our, that's, our, that's our experience in the spirit. Is It is up and down because there's a lot of things we have to do to maintain a life in the spirit. It requires a lot of maintenance. It's a lot of work to be free. <laughs> right? And so it is important to us to understand the Lord has given us access and a pathway and wisdom that we can live in the Spirit, but we have to decide, I want to live in the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't wake I don't know that there's very many mornings ever I wake up in the Holy Ghost. It does happen. Usually on Sunday mornings. The Lord is gracious and He knows I need to feed the sheep. And so I, many Sunday mornings I'll wake up and the Lord has given me a dream, given me a message. I'll dream about somebody and I'll, I'll kind of file that away and figure out how that fits in what I'm feeling and thinking. Sometimes it, it's what I preach and sometimes it's just in my mind about what's going on this week. And I believe that the other six days that we live, sometimes we, we have to make ourselves pray. I mean, I, my flesh doesn't really like to pray. I know, it may makes me carnal. Uh, it's a reality. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? How many times have we felt that way when we weren't in the Spirit? When we weren't in the Spirit. And the challenge is so much of life is in, it's, it's not in the air. It's so much of life. I, I wonder percentage-wise, Brother Ryan, how much time an airplane, as much as it flies, how much time an airplane stays on the ground compared to how much time the airplane stays in the air. And again, that's a perfect thing we have to recognize, even in the life of the spirit of a believer. We have so much we have so much life on the ground. We have kids, right? We have bills. We have family. Uh, we have to cut the grass. I never feel spiritual cutting the grass. I have never had a heavenly vision cutting the grass. I, I personally don't enjoy in the grass. But if I want to live in peace and harmony with my wife, I have found that makes her so happy if I will but cut the grass. Right? And there are things that I do in my life that, that please my father, that please God. And he'll look down and say, oh, he prayed today. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, he fasted today. You know, there is an idea that, you know, how many of you like to please your mama? You like to see your daddy smile. You like to see your wife happy with you. You like your children to be proud of you. There are things that we can do to say, I am a wife-pleasing husband. I am a son-pleasing father. But the greatest designation that we should ever pursue is that we would be a God-pleasing because ultimately, when we are operating in the dimension of pleasing God, chances are, when the Spirit moves, we're going to fly. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. For that, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending His own Son the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, comma, what's it say? Who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the Flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is, it's just not going to fly. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because. Why? Because the carnal mind is an enemy is at war against God. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, 
neither indeed can be. It's impossible for the carnal mind to be submitted to God. So how do I get my carnal mind to be submitted to God? I've got to get my carnal mind and put it under the, the... You ever had a really dirty cloth? Just, you know, you scrub tires. I'd my wife probably... I've scrubbed tires sometimes with claws I'm not supposed to. But you, you, you use it. You, you wipe down the table or you clean up the floor or you wash the car. It's filthy. That's like our brain. And we have to put that thing underneath some, some warm hot water and add a little soap and maybe scrub a little bit. But if you keep working at it, you can make a dirty cloth clean. And in the same way, our minds are so... Even in a, it just living in this world, our, our brains get dirty. Right? Our, our spirits get corrupted. Our, our souls get contaminated. And what do we need? We need the Lord to take our brain and wash it in the Holy Ghost. That we would be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Verse 8, so then that they that are in the flesh, what's it say? Cannot please God. Please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, who is Paul is not writing to Christians, to sinners about sinners. He's writing to Christians about Christians. And he is saying to a Christian, if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you don't belong to Him. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It's what you are. Not, uh, possession is nine-tenths of the law. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do... Oh, that's a powerful scripture right here. If ye through the Spirit... What's it say? Do mortify the deeds of the flesh. The deeds of the body, ye shall live. Mortify. Anybody want to give me a synonym for mortify in this context? For the right Bible scholar that you are? Mortify. Uh, enlarge. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, I think a good example of this is uh, if you got weeds that are growing around your plant, huh? Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Subjecting. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a good example of it is, is uh, you have to bring your flesh to church so you can pray your flesh through. You got to make yourself pray. You got to make yourself fast. You have to make yourself worship. How many times have you been in church and your first response wasn't to clap your hands? Your first response is just to sit there and look around and check everybody out, right? But you have to say to your flesh, "Hey, flesh." I'm going to clap my hands. Hey, flesh. I'm going to raise my hands. And, and, and I, it, it, I think a perfect picture of this is kind of like these flower beds out here. If we leave those flower beds the way they are here, the sun's going to come up. And the water's going to fall. And we will have what, what we call a flower bed will really be a weed bed. And that's the same way with our life. We have to pull the weeds and plant the seeds. Somebody say that with you. Pull the weeds. Pull the weeds. Plant the seeds. Plant the seeds. And if you want to have a flower bed, you've got to pull the weeds. Plant the seeds. You've got to purposely, intentionally plant in your life what you want to bloom in your life. And so it is important for us to recognize the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of sin and death. It comes through active, intentional Decisions that we make in a daily process to say, God, I want you to help me to fly, to move, to walk, to live, to be born of the Spirit. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh 
to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Here's the big payoff. If you'll be led by the Spirit of God, you are going to have a special designation. You are the sons <coughs> of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father. Abba Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and the children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, then we may also be glorified together. And so there is the law, the Old Testament law, there is the law of sin and death. There is, without a doubt, the law of the mind. There is the law of the harvest. But there is the perfect law of liberty, which is encapsulated in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the aerodynamics, if you will, of how we live above the gravity of of this world, of carnality, of sin and death. John chapter 8 and verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. It is important for us to recognize freedom is not without its constraints. Freedom without constraints is anarchy. And anarchy will produce its own special form of chains and darkness. Freedom is not free. And freedom is not without restrictions. However, when we operate within the constrictions of liberty, we will never be more free. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Here it is. Ephesians chapter 4 and 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. Or somebody say put off. Put off. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be, what's it say? <coughs> Renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I, I can say without a doubt there is righteousness of Christ that is imputed to us by faith. If I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that faith imputes to me the, 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 the righteousness of Christ. But a lot of people have a false perception of that glorious, righteous garment of Christ. I liken it to the fact that if we consider the righteousness we've been given by God, if we looked at it like a wedding dress. And we are getting ready to meet the groom. We would be sure that we would keep our garments spotless and without wrinkle. And it's tough to live in this world in a wedding garment. But that's what we have. And what, what, that's, what that means is everywhere we go, <laughs> everywhere we go, it's a dirty environment. And we have to come home, we have to start our day, and we have to just make the understanding the Lord is coming back for a church that is without spot or blemish or any such thing. You say, well, that's too hard for me. Of course it is. <laughs> you can't do it. But you can do it with the Spirit of God in you. I, chapter 7 describes how challenging it is to live a righteous, holy life in this damn, damn filled world. Pardon me. I come out part right. We live in a damned world. We live in a world that is full of corruption. I'm sorry, that, I did, that came out a little different. We do. We live in a world full of corruption. And it is a, a damned world. The Bible says, for God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
And so the Lord wants our world to be redeemed. He wants our life to be redeemed. But our part of the equation is that we, we walk in a way. If you read the book of Revelation, it talks about that, that the white raiment of the saints is, is, is their prayer. It's their, their, their deeds, their, their works of righteousness that, that we do do. We're not saved by works. We're saved by we're saved by grace, but we are kept in grace by what we do, what we say, and how we live. How do we do it? By grace. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God is the empowerment that helps me to live a life that is free, that is exemplified, that is described in Romans chapter eight. How can I live Romans chapter eight? By the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. And in James chapter 1 verse 22. I think this is a good way to wrap this up. Why don't you read it with me? But be ye doers of the word. And not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word. And not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and, and what? Continueth. And continueth there and he being not a forgetful here but a doer of the the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Keep reading. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, and widows in their infliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. That's the perfect law of liberty. And I believe it's a hope. I believe it's something that is attainable. It is something available. And we just have to decide, you know what? Uh, we can do this by the help and grace of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you, O oh God, for your word and for the working of your wonderful, mighty, holy grace. Lord Jesus, for we are saved by grace and not of works, Lord. It is a gift of God. We thank you today. You've given us access, Lord, to a whole new dimension of reality that was never available until of the outpouring of the Spirit that happened in Acts chapter 2. Lord, I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost in my life, in this church, in the lives of those, Lord Jesus, that truly want to be free. Lord God, lead us, guide us, help us. Make your word a reality in us that we would be led by your word, filled by your word, Lord Jesus, and sanctified by your word. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen.